Coming up on Playwrights Roundtable, a down and out Shakespearean actor relies on his girlfriend for support. Welcome to Playwrights Roundtable. I'm your host, Al Pergandy. PRT is Central Florida's only year-round producer of original stage works. Writers are nurtured and critiqued at our free monthly workshops. This unique page-to-stage process creates one-act shorts that are showcased at our PRT productions. Up next is Seven Sonnets, written by Stephen J. Miller and directed by Jamie Lynn Woods. Places, everyone. It's time for the show. I start with a brief prologue, meant to shock. Something to get my professors to talk. You may laugh or cover your blushing eyes. Yes, I dress to tease, provoke, and surprise. In Shakespeare's time, all parts were played by males, and it never affected ticket sales. Some scholars surmise that gender, in fact, had little to do with the play or act, but that our Shakespeare purposely bent gender constructs, thus forming new intent. Did Will Shakespeare politically start the great war of sexes through his art? I would never, in one dissertation, go into such detailed ministrations. But when a man dressed as woman pretends to be a man disguised, as in Twelfth Night, does the rule of the sexes also bend, subtly giving women more equal right? Did Shakespeare start, through dramatization, the birth of gender equalization? Many sonnets lack significations. Indicatory pronouns are missing. There's not one identification. Was it man or woman Will was kissing? A sonnet, a love poem, a token. Words often otherwise left unspoken. No helpful he or she to light our way through the bard's rhyming aphrodisiacs. Were these tender couplets meant for, say, Old England's Juliet's? Or for its Jack's? Let me not to the marriage of true minds and mit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, though his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Yes. Did you remember to send it in? Yes. Dylan, but the envelope is still where I left it on the end table. Oh, baby, I know it's hard to cope with rewriting your dissertation yet again. Honey, I read it and I thought it was good, really good, and I'd have bet our own money that you gave it your best shot. I told you I would support you through this. There's no shortage of work. God knows the firm's busy. A stack of files this tall waits for me, and daily it grows and grows. Someday, when you've got your masters and we're married, maybe well, then I'll start school and Shakespeare and you can take care of me. I'll be the student and you the working fool. All that fearsome energy I've spent and still we're struggling just to make the rent. I fell in love with a Shakespeare scholar. I gave up worrying about dollar or cent or sense <coughs> or even scent. And <laughs> Bud, you need to find yourself a shower. You stink. Let me guess. I smell like failure. Oh, the party starts in less than an hour. You look like death, only a bit paler. Uh, I think. Nice, long, hot bath would do you wonders. Come on, up and Adams, Get those cute little buns into gear. Well, I've set out clothes on the bed for you. Oh, don't wear the shirt you wore on Saturday. That thing's almost worn out. 
never understand how the male species wears their raggedy, old, discolored shirts with stains of food and cuffs that fray. Never think to throw the thing away. I had a dream I'd be your great knight in shining armor, earning a living teaching at a university. Or I might take a job at a small college My giving- My knight? Dylan, what an old cliche. Didn't that dumb, sexist idea go the way of the dinosaur? We know better, you and I. How to get through and what to do. I know you. Don't you want to have kids too? That is just something we'll have to work to. Aren't you excited about the soiree? You are the guest of honor, by the way. Uh, the party's in honor of my failure. Weird. Your mom forgot that on the mailer. Come on, Dylan. Go and wet your worried noggin. I promise you'll feel better. And while you're washing your cute little tail, I'll just go drop the rent check in the mail. Do we have enough money to cover? You'll never have to worry, my lover. <laughs> I'm kept. Yes, that you are. And don't forget who owns you. I'm sure you'd never bet you'd end up having to work so hard to support a damn loser. God, you need to get in the shower. I'm not your mother. Phil, I did not choose a loser lover. We'll get through this one way or another. Now, to the shower, hot water and soap. We're fine. No. You are. Oh. <laughs> fine. Honey, we'll cope. <laughs> has been said, and many unions prove, candor has no place in the success of marriage, nor truth a part of trusty love. I am no sage, but I do sense above these sideways winks and through the tempests of life. Love's truth stands firm and fixed and unmoved, as Shakespeare said, unbending in the sway. But also loving changes and shifts like we do ourselves, learning from day to day, revealing ourselves. We're like precious stone worked in the sculptor's hand to end the way we were meant to eternally be known. Marble's true sculpture the artist removes. True love's nature in due time living proves. Thanks for watching Playwrights Roundtable. If you'd like the theater, enjoy writing, directing, or would like to audition for one of our one act plays, check out what's happening at theprt.com or join us on Facebook. I'm Al Pergandy, and I'll see you at the theater. <laughs>